Connections, formerly the California Institute for Mental Health, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm also pleased to be joined by Darcy McGaffick, who is providing technical support and will be co-moderating with me. This webinar is funded through our contract with the California Department of Healthcare Services. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Number one, we encourage you to submit your questions during the presentation by typing your question in the question box in your control panel. When we pause for questions, Darcy will read your question aloud for the presenters to respond. And if you have a specific presenter to whom you are addressing your question, please let us know that in your question. If you pre-registered, you should have received by email a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation and a few other handouts. If you did not receive those, please notify us now through the question box and we will make sure to email them to you. We have three polling questions at the beginning of the webinar that we would like your response to, and there will also be a, a brief survey at the end of the session as you exit the GoToWebinar. And we thank you in advance for taking a few moments to share your feedback. We really count on your feedback to help us inform future webinars and to give us um, information about how we can improve these and really um, meet your needs the best way we can. We will be starting up a new series of webinars in September, and we'll be posting that calendar through the CalSec listserv. I also want to let you know that we're recording this webinar. It will be available in the future on the CIBHS YouTube channel. The link to the YouTube channel is listed on one of the last slides in today's presentation, along with my contact information. And that will take you right to the KDA playlist. And also, um, CIBHS, says we post a lot of our information. You're welcome to look at there. So now, for recording purposes, I'm going to be pausing for about five seconds now to begin our recording. During the pause, you will remain connected so there's nothing for you to do. Once again, we will be pausing now for five seconds to begin recording. Good afternoon. Welcome to the California Institute for Behavioral Health Solutions KDA webinar series. This project is funded through a contract with the Department of Healthcare Services. Today's webinar is Engaging Youth in the Impl Implementation of Pathways to Wellbeing, or KDA. Before I turn over our presentation to the first presenter, we have three polling questions that we would like you to answer. Actually, before we do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview also. Um, and a little bit about why the importance of youth engagement and the key value of the core practice model. Next slide, please. Youth are full partners and are, are really in the full process of KDA. And one of the things is that we know that we want to include parents and families and youth. Um, there are different ways we can involve youth in KDA. And we know that there are counties that have different ways of engaging youth. Some may have them as employees. Some may have them through community-based organizations. Um, some may have them working through uh, child welfare, some may be in behavioral health or mental health, and we know that there are different, uh, there are different ways to do this. Um, so today what we want to do is just share with you three different models of involving youth, and we're looking at this from different aspects. Um, we're going to look at a statewide organization through California Youth Connections. We're going to hear from Voices of Napa County. And we're going to hear from a county program, from Riverside County Youth Partners Program. And, and all of our presenters today are youth, are young adults. Um, and we just want to let you know that so that you, they give their perspective in terms of their participation and, and work. Next slide. So we're going to do a few polling questions here to help us know um, who you are and where you work. So first of all, please tell us where you work, whether you're A, state or county child welfare, whether you're B, um, state uh, or county behavioral mental health, whether you're a contract agency or a community-based organization providing services, whether you're an education or training organization or other. And please check one now. Okay, so we have about 20% that are state or county child welfare, 44% state or county behavioral mental health, 31%
contract agency, CBO, 1% education, and 3% other. Great. So let's go to the next um, question. So tell us the nature of your work. Do you work directly with children and families? Are you a supervisor or a manager? Are you a family partner, youth, or peer provider? Are you a consultant, a trainer, or technical assistance provider? Or are you are another type of nature of your work? All right, so 19% of you work directly with children and families, 48% are supervisor or manager, 1% is a family partner or youth peer provider, 11% um, of you are consultants or trainers or other type of technical assistance provider, and 21% of you are in another category in terms of the nature of your work. Great. And then we have one final question. So in, in your county, do you have a formal youth partner program? Yes, no, or don't know. And we'll see those answers in a second here. So yes, 39%, 18% no, and 42% don't know. So that's good information for us. Great. Thank you so much. OK, we'll go back to the slides now. And um, I'm going to introduce our presenters. We're going to have three presentations, and then we will have questions at the end, followed by some wrap-up slides. Um, so these youth represent three different organizations and perspectives, representing the statewide perspective as California Youth Connections. They will discuss the importance of the youth voice in the development and implementation of state and local policies around foster care and mental health. Voices from Napa County will provide information on how partnering with youth and local agencies at the local level can improve services, supports, and outcomes for foster youth. And the Youth Partner Program for Riverside County will share how they have increased youth voice in staff meetings, work groups, stakeholder convenings, and system-wide improvement plans. We recognize that these organizations represent only a sample of some of the important work being done in California with engaging youth in KDA implementation. It's my pleasure now to welcome Eric Wagoner from the California Youth Connection. Eric is a recent high school graduate from Independence High School in Brentwood, California. Eric holds a part-time job with McDonald's and works as a Bay Area policy intern with California Youth Connection this past year. Eric plans to attend junior college this upcoming fall at Los Medanos College and wants to eventually transfer to a four-year university to complete his study in business administration. Eric believes that improving mental health issues will be beneficial because it will improve the foster youth in focusing on their issues and future endeavors. So please join me to welcome Eric. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Wagner. I am 19 years old. I am a member of the Contra Costa chapter with California Youth Connection, and I'm currently a student at Los Madonna's College. Um, next slide. So about California Youth Connection, California Youth Connection, CYC, is a youth-led organization that develops leaders who empower each other and their communities to transform the foster care system through legislative and policy change. We envision a world where foster youth will be equal partners in contributing to all policies and decisions made in their lives. In 1988, I mean 1988, excuse me, Foster Youth in California decided to create California Youth Connection, a new foster youth-led organization dedicated to youth empowerment, youth development, and policy advocacy. We now have over 500 members statewide with 33 county-based chapters. Outreach focuses on letting current and former foster youth know about their rights as foster youth, what resources are available to them, including what rights they have regarding mental health services. As a youth member, I have also worked at educating the broader community at large. We, pr we present our experiences and knowledge at conferences, forums, and community events like this. Most importantly, CYC engages current and former foster youth in policy advocacy to improve the child welfare policy and practice. CYC has provided me with the opportunities to develop my leadership skills. 
Some examples include each chapter is led by our members, a statewide youth legislative committee, a statewide youth advisory board, a statewide youth council that meets regularly with the director of California Department of Social Services, and several statewide youth internships, which I was a part of. Um, next slide, please. So in 2011, CYC sponsored the Foster Youth Mental Bill of Rights. Under the bill, Foster Youth would get the right to interview therapists, to be presented with a range of treatment options, and to be able to, treat, uh, to, be able to refuse medical treatment unless a judge orders it. So number one, you have the right to interview two to four therapists prior to working with them so that a connection can be built. I, I believe that this is important because it is crucial that one is able to connect with their therapist and be able to establish a comfortable relationship with someone who they're sharing their personal stress with. Number two, you have the right to refuse medication as long as you're not at risk of hurting yourself or others and you are at least 10 years old. Three, you have the right to be presented with all of your mental health options, including, but not limited to, holistic or natural approaches, mentoring, peer counseling, therapy, and medication. In addition, you have the right to refuse treatment after you've attempted your options. It is really important that a youth is given the option to try alternatives because I believe a youth should be given a chance at looking at other options instead of running the risk of being over-medicated. Next slide. You have the right to continue services with your therapist or counselor if you have moved placements within 30 miles of your previous placement. As you guys know, foster youth are often moved quite a lot. So, I mean, I think this is crucial that, you know, they're not jumping around from therapist to therapist. You know, things get lost. And so we want to make sure that we're able to maintain that relationship. It is the county's it is the County Department of Social Services' responsibility to find appropriate transportation to ensure you can continue these services. Number five, you have the right to have your mental health assessed by a trained evaluator who has no personal ties to you before you entered into services. Number six, you have the right to have mental health services provided outside of your place of residence. This is important because you need to trust that what they share will be safe and confidential. Sometimes, this, sometimes the placement triggers their mental health issues. Um, number seven, your social worker must help complete the necessary paperwork in order for you to obtain mental health services, and these services must be included in your emancipation checklist. Number eight, you have the right to obtain your health records, so whatever, health passport, education. Um, number nine, you have the right to confidentiality when interacting with mental health professionals unless you're at risk of harming yourself or others. Um, let me give you an, so an example of how CYC engages youth in mental health policy is through community organizing. Organizing, sorry. Um, in 2010, CYC covened the Voices of the Unheard Task Force to identify the challenges that foster youth face in accessing mental health and public health services and the quality of these services. The members created and distributed surveys to help uh, youth in San Bernardino, Riverside, and Los Angeles and CYC members across the state. In addition, the members held focus groups to better understand the challenges of these systems. Youth led speak outs and forums to share with key stakeholders what they needed to change. So what's happening now? The Mental Health Bill of Rights that was developed by the Voices of the Unheard Task Force unfortunately did not pass legislatively. However, the document is being revived in another, in another statewide initiative called the QI Project analyzing the use and misuse of psychotropic medication within the foster care system. We are hopeful that DCHS and CDSS will back the document and begin implementation in, the, in its new version. Eric, I'm going to stop you for just a moment. Darcy, I think you need to catch up on the slides there. Great. Thank um, you. Perfect. Um, next slide, please. Um, so most recently, five Bay Area CYC chapters created the Bay Area Mental Health Forum Project. I was part of this team and developed the framework for this effort. Um, so we surveyed youth all around from not only from Alameda, Contra Costa, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties, but we also surveyed some of our members in, uh, in the other chapters. Um, the, survey in, uh, the survey questions included what kind of medications the youth were on, coping strategies and other outlets the youth utilize in order to deal with stress, current services that youth uh, utilize, 
and the knowledge of services and how to access them. We really wanted to know the full picture of the youth's background and how they utilize co their coping strategies. Um, next slide, please. We ultimately presented these results to each county's uh, stakeholders, including social workers, case managers, supervisors, community partners, etc. We really wanted to bring everyone who's involved in a use case to understand what the use perspective was on their services. Our goal was to have these changes brought back and a collaborative, a collaborative change to be made. Um, our final report is due out by August. It will be available on CYC's website at calyouthcon.org. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you can see, uh, we, asked the, we asked the youth if they were currently taking medication for their mental health. 22% of the youth surveyed reported that they take some type of medication for mental health reasons. Um, out of the 22% of youth who said they took medications for mental health, 20% of youth believed that they were just fine with their medic without their medications. 11% knew why they were taking their medications because of their, di because of their diagnosis, behavior, etc. And 11% of youth felt that they only need, that they only need sometimes need their medication. So really, you can see that you know the youth understand kind of why they're taking their medication, but they believe that you know they would be quite all right without their medications. Um, a majority of youth agreed that people who receive mental health services are stigmatized and receive negative connotation. Um, the youth surveyed that identified as seeing a regular uh, therapist regularly, 48% identified their services were somewhat effective, and only 7% said that they were, uh, their services were very effective. So really, we want to make a collaborative change and make sure that the youth are feeling as if their, their voice is being heard and you know something's working. Um, next slide, please. Now I'd like to share some of the recommendations that the youth came up with. Um, issue one was that foster youth aren't aware of the mental health services available to them. So we wanted to have a community health fair in the county where youth can get more info on their mental health services. Um, our second recommendation was to invite an expert on foster youth mental health and, aware and wellness, and that they should be at the TDM meetings. Um, mental health service providers add, that, add their condition to the TAE websites to make easier access um, issue number two was that foster youth aren't given options as alternatives. So we really wanted to work with the youth to provide, uh, excuse me, we wanted to work with youth to provide outlets for behaviors. Um, issue number three was that foster youth don't have the time or resource to re receive mental health services. So our recommendation was to create a mobile services um, that could go directly to the youth in the community. So really working with the counties to see if that's possible. Um, issue number four was that every foster youth should receive quality and relevant mental health services. So we believe that the county should adopt the CYC Mental Health Bill of Rights for foster youth that you guys saw before. And as you can see, many youth are likely to reach out to their social worker and foster, uh, foster parents in order to access their mental health services. Social workers rank number one upon answered survey questions. So we we asked the youth, how do you guys find out? How did you guys find out about mental health services? Like, how do you guys go about accessing them? And so social workers was the number one, and then um, foster parents were number two in that question. Um, so many youth stated that there weren't enough services being provided. So working with the counties to, you know, create a change and make sure that we offer more services and that there's more therapists out there for the youth. And then many youth believe that the times available to access mental health services, such as therapy, were generally accessible and flexible. So that's a good part because, as you guys know, youth go, I mean, youth go to school, they have after school uh, activities. So as long as the youth are able to access those services in times that they um, have the free time, that's very important. Um, as you guys can see, the local engagement, um, CYC has 33 chapters throughout California, ranging from Napa up down to Los Angeles. Um, so please find out if you have a local chapter, um, as you guys can do that, you guys can do that at um, www.calithcon.org. Um, ask to get on their agenda of their meeting, like if you guys want to start talking, getting involved with CYC and talking more about KDA, that's the way to go. Um, ask how they would like to be included in the implementation process. So 
really you guys want to get involved and speak with the youth and try to get you know get more information from them and see what we can do to create the change. Um, so find out how best to support youth attending the meetings. So really sit down with the youth and you know ask them. Um, organize youth focus groups or develop surveys. So that's what we did. We went to our five chapters and we really you know we we went out to community partners and you know we were able to see what the youth needed and so I'm very glad that we were a part of that project. Um, as far as my local involvement, I've been working with the KDA work group out here in Contra Costa County. And I think for the most part, um, the KDA implementation has been definitely, it's been difficult for almost every county I'm hearing. And so, especially Contra Costa, we've been trying to figure out how to get this up and going, but there's so many loopholes and there's there's just a lot of work to be done. So really start sitting down with the youth and getting involved is very crucial. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to um, check out our website, calyouthcon.org. Um, please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you guys have any questions, you guys can email me at eric at calyouthcon.org. Great. Thank you. That was a great presentation, and we appreciate it. And 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 all of our presenters, we have um, their contact information, so you can reach out to them. So we're going to move to to now to Napa County, um, and our next presenter is Andres Cantara from Voices from Napa County. Andres Cantara attends Napa Valley College and is working on his associate's degree in, in business administration. After graduation, he plans on transferring to an automotive vocational school, automotive vocational school. He currently works full-time at Voices in Napa as a site coordinator. Andres has been involved with the foster care system since the age of 10 and has always wanted to influence change. He feels he is doing that now by helping the youth that he works with every day. So Andres, please go ahead and start your presentation. Hello, my name is Andres Cantera. Um, I'm the operations manager here at Voices Napa. Um, just a quick reference, some people may know us as Voices uh, Sonoma or Santa Rosa. That is our sister site in Santa Rosa. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Voices uh, originally started in 2005. Leaders from um, the county, county workers, probation, mental health, public education came together to address the question and problem, what happens to youth after they emancipate out of care or are in the process of emancipating out of care? Um, they, they came up and addressed this situation and connected with Voices on the Move uh, parent organization, which is on the move, um, which is also a nonprofit. And they came up with the idea of creating a one-stop shop uh, that would be led by youth. And the way that they developed this idea and plan was they did a collaboration with 10 current or former foster youth to develop the one-stop shop of having all needs met in one one set location so that youth weren't traveling around town and or trying to have find a way of transportation or connecting with workers when at that time it is very hard to do those things. Um, so Voices, as I said, is a nonprofit organization here in Napa. Um, they started with the collaboration of numerous county agencies including probation, mental health, human services and education. Um, we receive a majority of our funding from this county, state, and then uh, from a wide array of private, community, and county funds. Next slide. Um, Voices primarily focuses on three programs. The Independent Living Program, which is the IOP program, which we get ca uh, contracted out through the county. The Explorations College and Career Center. And uh, the Changes Health and Wellness Program. And throughout the slide, I'll be explaining what each of these three programs do. Next slide, please. So the independent living program, which is contracted throughout the, through the county to us, um, focuses on uh, basic and advanced life skills, which we put on through one-on-one -on -one coaching and uh, workshops. One of the biggest things we do on one-on-one -on -one coaching is our life conferences, which is youth youth focused, where they get to invite. What, however many supporters they feel that they need and that they trust into their conference. 
and get to set up what goals that they want to achieve. Um, and then we get to figure out who is best from their supporters to help set the set to meet those goals and the set time that they choose. So the entire live conference is all about you having the freedom and you having the 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 power to set when and where you, you can finish your own goals. Next slide, please. The end of, uh, the another part of it is the workshops. So we do life skills workshops, um, which focus on health, cleanliness, mental, uh, mental, mental awareness of where they are at in their lives, how they're feeling, um, and then just regular, regular skills that they need to when they're going to be moving out on their own and/or transitioning back into their own home of care. Next slide, please. Um, the Explorations College and Career Center is our um, mainly focus for college and career centers, so that is open to all of our youth throughout Napa County and uh, really wherever you come from because we are a youth center. Um, we focus on working on resumes, cover letters, job searching, job application, mock interviews, just for success, um, and anything really around making sure that they're, they are pursuing a job and or have the opportunity to be able to go out and search for a job and they have all the tools necessary to reach where they want to go around job-based things. And we can continue on to the, the next slide. College support. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, youth who are transitioning out of foster care really haven't thought about college, uh, their college options yet. So one thing we do do is sit down with them and uh, find out what exactly they plan on doing if they do want to attend college and what their options are. So we do the college searching with them, connecting them to counselors, uh, filling out the uh, applications for the colleges, filing the FAFSA forms, uh, looking to see if they apply or meet any criteria for scholarships, grants, um, really anything that can help support them in continuing on their education after high school. Next slide. Our third program is Changes, which is the health and wellness um, portion of Voices. So um, around that, they do a lot of physical health wellness, which can be considered doing yoga, hiking. Um, Voices actually sponsors a softball team here in Napa. We do recreational games after school, teaching youth how to, we connect with a local chef here in Napa, teaching them how to cook. And then we also have our own uh, few sites. We have a garden where we teach youth how to be able to grow and plant their own food and in a way shows them that something that they create can be turned into um, a really good tool for them to, to pretty much to support themselves and not always having to go to the store or buy all their food and everything and it can be really cost effective. And then one thing we just recently started is our harm reduction groups to support youth who are wanting to quit anything that can be harmful to them. So that's mental, mentally wise, physically wise. Um, it's really whatever they come in for to get help with. We can sit down and have a, a wide range of groups to sit down and discuss what's going on and what is a better alternative for them. On to our next slide. So one of the things that we are extremely proud of with the Changes Program is that um, our clinic, LA clinic here in Napa, is we are a satellite for them. So twice a month they come into Voices and set up um, appointments with our youth, which means that our youth can come into our center and meet with um, a doctor, a nurse, and then get referrals out to other places rather than going, having to go and sit at our local clinic for a few hours trying to meet with the doctor. Um, here it's a consistent doctor, so they get to know their doctor and have a personal connection with them. Um, along those lines, if a youth comes in and needs help to try to get into a clinic, for the first time, we can sit down and fill out the medical application or um, any other really any other form of insurance to make sure that they can get in and get seen for any medical health issue that they might have or just a simple checkup that they might need. Um, next, our next slide, please. So one thing that Voices is really known for is that we are extremely youth friendly and youth led. Um, so it's. In saying that, in each one of our programs, we do have a youth staff that gives their opinion, has really the biggest say in how each program looks 
and how overall voices look, voices in general is. Um, so in total, we have three three youth staff, but then we have a fourth youth that um, has been here a, a little while longer who leads those three and tries to get them into the, into the direction of being able to progress further up and ultimately be able to lead and run their own events and or workshops here at the center or outside of the center. Um, our youth staff, uh, in collaboration with at least one adult staff, uh, hold one event that is primarily youth-run and youth-led. Um, at least once a month. Youth have the strongest opinions on how the events look, what, how they are run, who is invited, what criteria is ran. Um, it's really all about what the youth want and how we can deliver it to them best. All right, next slide, please. Um, Voice, so Voices is recently doing some more, a lot more mental health work. Uh, Voices staff provide a voice for youth and oversee each program to ensure it is reflective of their needs, uh, facil facilitate youth in obtaining needed mental health services, and integrate that plan into their existing pro and onto our existing program by doing the case management and making sure that they're, they're receiving all the services that they need to be mentally, mentally stable and are be able to move on forward with whatever they're trying to do and they're completing their lives. Um, as case managers, we ensure they take the necessary steps to address their mental health needs, including transportation, referrals, as well as monitoring their goals um, and seeing if there's anything that we can do or connect them to anyone that can progressively take forward steps rather than taking a step back and then having to redirect them somewhere else. So we make sure that we try to get that process right the first time so that the youth doesn't have to feel that they aren't receiving what they need. Next step, please. Our next slide. Uh, sorry. Um, so one big thing about uh, mental health and the KDA implementation, our youth have uh, started to make more of a stronger presence in how mental health is directed and, and uh, serviced here in Napa County. Um, so not too long ago, they were implemented in some more of the peer groups and then the discussions of what what steps can be taken to make it a lot more youth friendly and how it can be better service to youth not only in foster care or probation but every youth who necessarily needs mental health services. Um, um, one big thing is that we recently had not too long ago, um, I believe it was in October, is that we took quite a few not only youth staff but some youth and adult staff to one of the discussion forums to be able to figure out what the youth needs are, how best to to service them and see what they can really do to um, uh, to ultimately meet their goals. Um, one newer thing that we're trying is that um, we're trying to have mental health clinicians come to Voices on a regular basis, not for therapy, but to be available for questions and really for the youth to be able to meet with someone and discuss what their options are, not necessarily going to just one place that they have multiple options to see where they can go what they can do. Um, and then one also good thing that is common is they recommended a transition period for taking medication to teach them how and when to take it so they can do it on their own when they leave care. And that's one thing that we are really proud of because it, a lot of times youth come in here and they don't want to be told when or how they can take their medication or what they can or can't do. And so we sit down with them and try to figure out the best plan that works for them and it's really just them taking control and initiative of how their mental health is serviced and delivered to them. And uh, that's just a little bit about voices. Um, I encourage anyone, if you are in the Napa County area, to stop by and you are more than welcome to get a tour, meet with some of our youth, um, or anyone really if you just want to come in and see how we are run on a day-to-day -day basis or if you have any follow-up questions be more than happy to uh, answer those for you. Great. Thank you so much, Andreas. Great presentation. And so if you go to the next slide, Darcy, we'll, you can see the contact information. Um, and also, this is also in your handouts too, so thank you so much. So our third presentation today and final one is from the Youth Partner Partners Program from Riverside County, and we are happy to have two presenters today. 
Keith Diaz is a youth partner at the County of Riverside Department of Public and Social Services. He received his BA from Cal State University San Marcos. And after several years living in San Diego, Keith decided to pursue a career in Riverside as a youth partner. Keith is also a former foster youth as a dependent of Los Angeles County. He spent his childhood in foster care, overcoming adversity to be in the position in life that he is in now. And also joining us today from Riverside County is Michelle Wool. Michelle has worked in the child welfare field for more than 15 years. She's held various positions from social worker to regional manager in Riverside County. She's also worked in county human resources, supporting the social services team and representing the county in arbitration hearings. She currently serves as the regional manager for the Youth and Community Resources Region, which includes oversight of four family resource centers, the independent living program, case management services for youth ages 16 through 20 in EFC and a professional student intern. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and partner to, and parent to four busy children. So Riverside, please start your presentation. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, letting us be a part of this uh, exciting presentation. So we wanted to just let you know that uh, the Youth Partner Program has been in Riverside County for about two years. We started it as a pilot project, and we had some temporary staff that joined us that were CYC members. So we had a close connection with our California Youth Connection in our county, and we're able to bring some of those uh, folks on board as some temporary staff. We had such great success with the program that we sought to use some of our um, dollars that are more flexible through RAP and through some of realignment opportunities to bring some full-time permanent youth partners to the team. So we currently have six full-time youth partners on board that are all former foster youth. And I'm joined today by one of our fabulous youth partners, Keith. So you can move to the next slide. And I think what's important uh, about Riverside County is that the uh, mission statement for our department is partnering with communities to protect and empower vulnerable people. And in order to do that, we felt that it's best to look towards those folks that we're serving, and in this case, our youth and families, and look to adding youth partners to everyday work that we have here in the county. So it was a big step to bring them on board. You can move to the next. So the Youth Partner Program in Riverside, we felt that the youth partners are uniquely qualified to work with our youth because they are former foster youth. And when we work with our youth, we hear from them many times that the social worker is really just somebody that gets paid to do their job. And folks that come on as volunteers or mentors, that uh, we have a lot of faith-based partners and others that work with our youth, that they are able to connect with those communities. Um, members that are interested folks in a different way because they're volunteering their time, that they're there simply because they love and care for youth and want to help them to improve their life. And to that effort, we felt that our youth partners, while they're paid employees, we have to step up as an organization and as a county and recognize the value of consumer feedback. In child welfare, that concept is a little bit newer. I had the opportunity to work with Riverside's Department of Mental Health when they were implementing the Mental Health Services Act and began to learn about the recovery model and consumer feedback and parent partners that have been around in the mental health discipline for a bit longer. So it was exciting as Riverside County began to implement the Family to Family Initiative from Casey Family Programs that parent partners and youth partners were a part of that. So way back in 2006 when I uh, was learning more about the next steps in Family to Family, have this vision and dream about youth partners and parent partners. So it's, we've come full circle and taking some steps from our partners and colleagues in mental health to bring youth partners here to children's services. So our youth partners serve a variety of roles and functions within our organization. And Keith will um, take you to the next slide and share a little bit about what he does on a daily basis. Hi. Can you guys hear me fine? Again, my name is Keith Diaz. I am a youth partner with Riverside County. I am a former foster youth with my dependency being held in Los Angeles County. I am a 2011 graduate holding my BA in Human Development and Children's Services. Um, so when looking at this slide, what we've done is by engaging youth in our implementation of Pathways to Wellness, the County of Riverside has introduced the Youth Partner Program. 
There are many counties that currently have youth partners, however the roles are very different. Most youth partners are employed by mental health or nonprofit organizations, most often taking on the role of a peer-to-peer -peer mentor. Riverside has taken a different approach to its youth partners, hiring former foster youth that are assimilated into Children's Protective Services. Again, youth partners are former foster youth, all with different backgrounds and experiences in foster care. Um, by doing this, Riverside is very, has very unique individuals with different insights and perspectives. Um, they are able to relate to youth in their current situations because of the real life experiences that they do have. Um, youth partners are able to share with youth and caregivers so that they may better understand the expectations that they should have regarding any services or support that they may need. Youth partners are able to address any concerns that a youth may have either directly or indirectly. An example of directly assisting would be just encouraging the youth and address, um, encouraging the youth and addressing any concerns that there are. An example of indirectly assisting them would be simply supporting them at their CFTs, going to court hearings with them, um, family visits, among others. They are also making sure that youth are engaged when decisions regarding their mental health needs are made, that they're, they are the ones ultimately making those decisions. Youth partners are the bridge that closes the gap for the needs and the wants of the youth, addressing any concerns that youth may have not that may not be comfortable addressing themselves with the department, caregivers, or even their families. Youth Partner Program is an optional program for the youth, and this is for a reason. It's really to make sure that the youth have a sense of permanency in their lives, that someone isn't there just because they have to be, so as to build stronger and long, longer lasting relationships. Next slide. So um, in this one, it's the roles and responsibilities of the youth, the social workers, and youth partners. Um, so setting the expectations are very important for the youth, the social workers, and also the youth partners. Everyone has to be held accountable and responsible to maintain their part in their relationships. Youth are responsible for keeping in contact uh, with the youth partner and keeping them up to date with any changes that, they, that may need to be addressed. The responsibility of the social workers is updating the youth partners with, the new, with any new information or changes to the case and to keep open communications with the youth partners. So the responsibilities of the youth partners are to keep in contact with the youth and to also keep the social worker up to date with their interactions with the individuals. Next slide. So um, the youth partners have been participating in a lot of training. In Riverside County, we've been able to uh, begin hiring social workers after a long economic downturn. And we've incorporated our youth partners into panel presentations along with other trainings. The youth partners actually play a role in the training of our KDA initiative or in Riverside Pathways to Wellness so that the social workers are hearing directly from youth that had their own experiences in foster care. So they have also trained on um, how to have more meaningful social worker contact and offer tips to social workers around their engagement with the youth and with the caregivers. So our youth ha uh, partners have also started to participate in some of the trainings for our foster parents that happen on a quarterly basis within our um, geographic training meetings within the county. Our youth partners participate in almost every single work group or initiative that we're working on within the organization. And some of those things are the Commercially Sexually Exploited Children Task Force in Riverside County. One of our youth partners had the experience of being an impacted youth, and she holds a, a prominent place at the table as we develop training and provide those trainings out into the community along with our own staff. Our youth partners do presentations on permanency with our social workers and in our community. They participate in our Child Abuse Prevention Council. and We have about six different councils that meet across the supervisorial districts in the county. So they participate in each of those boards. 
We have a youth partner that works with us on our LGBTQ initiatives and ensuring that that population of youth feel that they have a voice and are um, feeling that our system is not one that's not open to their needs and looking at how we can better support that, that uh, impacted youth. We have a special work group around racial disproportionality and disparity that has been an issue in child welfare. And our youth partner participates in that group and has really helped to move some of our agenda items forward so that we actually have community members that attend our team decision making meetings for families of color to help ensure that that community is strong and supported and able to meet that family's need of trying to keep children in their home and supported in their community. We host an ILP, Independent Living Program Consortium Group. That's a collaborative of about 30 different community-based partners and service providers. Our youth partners attend that meeting and help direct the agenda that moves forward uh, there. We also have the Kinship Navigator in Riverside County, which is an organization of iFoster. Some of you may be familiar with iFoster. And they have a federal grant along with the 211 and California United Way. And our youth partners help to provide some additional feedback and upgrades to the Kinship Navigator to make it a bit more youth friendly and help our caregivers know how to use that, um, that navigation portal as well for services and resources. With um, the extended Medi-Cal uh, option for former foster youth, our youth partners have helped to better reach out in the community and made a lot of changes to our forms and brochures for both extended CalFresh and extended Medi-Cal so that we're reaching our population of youth and not simply informing them that those resources are there, but to ensure that they're youth friendly and that the youth are treated properly when they are applying for those benefits. So those are just some of the examples of how our youth partners participate. And certainly in our Pathways to Wellness, they're a part not only of the community collaborative and the stakeholders meetings, but they actually sit on our steering committee and are important members there. And you can move to the next slide. So specific to KDA, we have, and I kind of mentioned this already, we have a number of work groups around case plan and case planning and family um, dynamics that would be beneficial. And the youth partners have played a huge role in reshaping how we engage the youth and the families and helping to get them to the CFC for both our subclass and our class population. I already mentioned that they serve on the steering committee. And not only do they participate in community forums, but they've helped lead some of those discussion groups. And you can move on. So again, youth partners have been active participants in the implementation of Pathways to Wellness in the county. We have helped in reviewing forms, brochures, pamphlets, and really looking for ways to be strength-based and sensitive to the families to ensure that families are comfortable in the process because we really don't want to want them to feel degraded or shamed. Um, youth partners also act as a second pair of eyes and ears for facilitators of the CFTs, making sure that the focus really stays on the youth and that they are driven by strengths and solutions rather than blame or shame. Um, awareness of formal and informal resources is also another responsibility that we have because it is important so as to better meet the needs of the youth and the families. And next slide. <laughs> And that's our contact information. One of the things that we wanted to highlight is that, of course, there are some challenges when you bring youth partners into your organization. And, and part of that is a readiness. And so we're constantly doing a readiness assessment. I have the pleasure of managing the youth partner program. And, and it really is a pleasure. And, and part of that is working with our social work staff, our supervisors, managers, and other community partners to ensure that they're in a place of hearing the feedback that comes from our youth partners, and if there are some you know, pauses that we need to take in order to regroup, um, certainly our language and ensuring that we are uh, sensitive to um, our families' needs and, and working to engage rather than shame or blame 
our families. So that's been um, a challenge in the implementation with KDA, and I think we're making some great progress and strides in that, but it's always something that has to be evaluated and assessed along the way. Great. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Absolutely. Keith. Great presentation, and um, we look forward to hearing more about your work as you, as you um, progress through this. Um, and I also I want to just comment on one thing Michelle said about how the, the mental health or behavioral health um, the counties or divisions of counties or departments um, have been more, have a longer history of including the consumer and family member voice. And I, and I think that your comment about it's somewhat newer to child welfare is a really important statement to make and, and sort of ways that we can learn from each other in terms of how we involve youth in our work. So I just wanted to share that. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, and so if you look on your um, question box, in the, there's a question box found about two-thirds of the way down on your control panel. Um, and please type in questions there. Darcy will read the questions. If your question is targeted towards a specific individual or presenter, please let us know. And so go ahead and ask some questions. OK, and we actually have some questions already um, ready to go. It looks like uh, Graydon Ford asked regarding recommendation for issue number two, and that's re re going back to a previous um, presentation. What type of behavioral outlets have you been looking at? So that sounds like it's a question for, um, I think, for, for CYC about behavioral, about outlets for behaviors. So Eric, do you want to comment on that? Hi, guys. So, yes. So can you repeat the question one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. It's um, talking about recommendation for issue number two. Um, what type of behavioral outlets have you been looking at? Um, I think that when they talk, when we talk about behavioral outlets, like, um, I want to say more, like, going back to the holistic alternatives, like, youth being able to participate in yoga, just look, like at yoga or, you know, just finding other options instead of just going straight to medications. So more holistic, you know, opportunities is that what we're asking. Because when we ask youth, like, you know, hey, do you understand why, you know, do you understand why you're taking your medication? Most youth know why they're taking their medication, but do they have the option to not take their medication? No, not really. And do they have any other ways of dealing with their stress, no, because they haven't been presented those different options. Okay. And um, Daniel Heipel had asked uh, regarding voices. Uh, voices does direct service and case management in mental health? Directly, we don't do direct services, but we do do the, the, um, the referrals and transition to them to go to mental health and receive those services, but we can do some type of in-house uh, where we do meet with the youth and can sit down and figure out what exactly might be bothering them. But overall, on direct services, we do not for mental health. Okay, and um, Carolyn Reyes had asked, uh, Andres, you didn't mention the LGBTQ youth program of voices. I think maybe you did come loop back around to that. Um, I'm not sure. Can you say something about it? So the LGBTQ uh, program is not directly tied into voices. It is one of the programs from uh, On The Move. They do share a center here with voices. Um, so the LGBTQ program is actually an initiative here in Napa that uh, was started about two years ago by Ian Stanley, who is one of the ex-directors of Voices. Um, their program probably do is, does a lot of Q, uh, group focus groups with the youth here, to not only focus groups, but regular um, friendly based groups to be able to come in, meet each other, and they have a safe place to hang out. And not only do they get to hang out here, but they have the entire center that they can, they can utilize. Um, Ian primarily focuses on a lot of um, youth fr um, LGBTQ friendly uh, trainings here in the county through the schools, uh, probation, and then he also goes up, up county uh, into Calisoga and Santa Elena. Okay, and we have a question. This is for Riverside. How do you make the meetings, the meetings meaningful for the youth partners in attendance? 
That's a, a marvelous question. A lot of times we meet with a youth partner prior to the meeting and make sure that they understand where a project is at. And that kind of depends on the meeting. If it's a brand new initiative or something that a new policy that we're about to come forward with, if they're coming in on the very beginning of the project, we don't tend to have as many behind the fence scene meetings with the youth partner. The first thing we do is we take a look at the um, topic and our youth partners have different passions. We really want to match them with an area of their own passion, not simply assign a youth partner to have a youth partner at the meeting. And again, I mentioned the readiness assessment within the organization, and I think that's definitely a piece of that readiness assessment. Are you just using youth as a token to be present, or are you engaging them in an area of their own passion, concern, perhaps even expertise, and how they can be a solid contributor and be meaningful in the decision-making uh, process in that meeting. I hope that answers the question. Keith, do you want to add anything? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Cindy Nabader. Are all the youth peer mentors required to be former foster youth? For Riverside County, the answer to that is yes. And we did it on purpose because we felt that in starting our youth partner program that we wanted to use that um, opportunity to further engage our youth from someone that has lived in the system and experienced the system. Among our six youth partners, they have very diverse backgrounds. Some did achieve permanency with legal guardianship, others did not. So we're able to find, for the most part, among our population, that we can find a youth partner that has an experience that might match what a youth is experiencing to help connect them. Okay, and from Beth Cohen, we had a question. Does anyone have experience creating a youth advisory council specifically for wraparound? Michelle, maybe you could address that with your experience, and in in, in maybe not necessarily directly towards wraparound, but maybe some of your experience, you could, you could answer that. Yeah, that's um, not specifically with RAP, um, although I don't manage our RAP program, so I was just thinking I'm not even sure that they have a youth council that's connected to our RAP. Um, one of the things that might be more similar is our ILP consortium. So because it's all of our contracted service providers as well as our non-contracted service providers that are community-based um, that are working with our youth, most of them have youth councils or youth members as well, and that's something that we look for in terms of the membership of our ILP consortium. So they definitely have youth voice incorporated within their organizations as well. So with um, the youth partners, because we brought them on as um, permanent staff, we did a different type of hiring process. Instead of your traditional county, you know, flyer recruitment on the internet connected to the county, we actually asked them to not advertise it, and we sent the position out to our consortium group, which is an email group of about 150 folks. We also sent it out to our social work staff because our social workers are often remain connected to youth and former foster youth so that we were able to get, I think we had almost 70 applications and resumes that came in that were qualified for the position and we did 35 interviews for six positions. So by taking a little bit of a non-traditional approach to reach out to those organizations that we know already support youth voice we were able to um, draw a pretty good population um, to interview and, and start from that place. In the interview process, of course, we were not as, um, I have to be careful what I say, because it's a merit county, so you have to still maintain all of the standards and expectations in your hiring process so that it's a fair process for everyone, but we were perhaps a little bit more open in the interview process to ask follow-up questions and to give the youth the opportunity to uh, go back and respond to questions and answers in a different way. So it was definitely a different process to engage them even in hiring. 
some, so maybe that helps a little bit. I know there's some materials out there that we've reviewed in the past on youth councils as well to help inform us as we were starting the youth partner project. Okay, and we have a question. Um, what does CSD lingo mean? So CSD lingo, um, we're actually still getting familiar with all the acronyms, all the wording, um, things that someone who doesn't work for the county isn't necessarily familiar with. So part of our role when attending a meeting, when meeting with youth, meeting with families, is to really interpret those, those meanings um, to let them know what's going on, um, what all the acronyms mean, and what they're, what they're there for. So that, that's really the base of it. Okay. Like translating foreign language at child welfare. Okay. And um, uh, Jernika Martin asks, this question is for voices. How are um, youth connected to voices, and how long are the services typically? So youth are connected through voices through social workers, probation officers, uh, mental health does some referrals to us, um, and then, but our biggest way is word of mouth through you, uh, the youth we already serve. Um, and then service can, can range anywhere from, well our typical age range is 16 to 24, um, but that does not mean that we don't work with youth who are a little bit younger or who have already already eight, past the age of 24 if they've seen us and worked with us before we still do offer services to, to them because they have built that personal connection with our staff and the people who really revolve around our center. Okay and we have one more question uh, unless somebody would like to go ahead and start typing now because of course um, you can still have a little bit of time. The last question in the box is how does Riverside from Amber Condry, how does Riverside help to ensure uh, the CFT is youth focused. Did you um, create a specific template or an outline? Yeah, a lot of it comes down to our TDM, our team decision making facilitators that are at the moment facilitating the CFT. So I'm fortunate to have my own team decision making facilitator that reports in my program. So those um, CFTs that are done for the older youth, he's familiar and conducts the 90-day transitional team decision-making meeting that's required under extended foster care. So those um, TDMs are already uh, geared towards the youth. Another important piece of it is that the youth will often come to the meeting and they're upset, they're frustrated, they're angry. You know, they often say, it's another meeting about me. All these adults make decisions about me. And our youth partners in both the team decision-making meeting and the CFT can even step out with the youth and spend some time talking with them. They do try to talk to the youth before the meeting, sometimes over the phone, or they'll meet with them even several days before the meeting and let them know that they are the focus of that meeting. And if the meeting needs to stop to get um, a moment so that they can re-engage the youth then they're able to do that. Sometimes the youth still won't talk but they'll talk through a youth partner and we always allow that at the, um, at the meeting as well. I hope that helps. Great, Dorothy, is that the last question right now? I will look to see if one popped in. Hang on. Um, yeah, any th way to recruit youth partners from within one's community? Darcy, repeat that once you broke up. Sorry about that. Um, are, do you have any thoughts on the best way to recruit youth partners from within one's community? Okay, well, um, I can't tell you the best way of recruitment for our youth partners. Um, I can tell you how I was recruited. Um, I was recruited from school, so one of those IOP um, individuals that were part of the mailing list um, was a gentleman named Jim Mickelson at Cal State San Marcos. Um, he runs a program called A Scholars. It's a program directly focused for current and former foster youth to go to college. He was, he was able to send this um, opportunity out to me. 
and he emailed it to me, gave me some insight of what Riverside County was doing and how they're doing it. And I was able to, to really apply for the position. And that's really how I am here today. Great, thanks. Is that it, Darcy, for questions? That is it. So we're going to go through just about five final slides. Um, these are just some overall recommendations here. Um, these, a lot of this material is included in the um, attachments we sent you in the, the document um, in terms of youth engagement. These are recommendations that come from a variety of different sources based on people's experiences, based on some research. Um, and first of all, that engagement can mean different things to different people, and also that it, can, it occurs on a number of different levels. The International Association for Public Participation developed a scale for determining the level of engagement you're aiming for called the ladder of participa participation. And it's the fifth rung that we're really looking for in terms of the ultimate goal for true and effective engagement. But each step is important and it's necessary to get there. So the next slide will show us basically what those different um, ladders of engagement are. Um, informing and educating young people, you know, which is basically creating a connection between the issues and the youth lives. Gathering information from young people, that might be in the way of focus groups or questions and really trying to enable young, young people to share their opinions. Consulting with young people, having a shared exchange of ideas and a greater value on youth opinions. Involving young people, ideas and opinions of youth are deliberately sought and affect important decisions. And then the, the highest ladder here is to really establish collaborative partnerships with young people, which is a full-on collaboration between adults and youth. And in terms of the benefits, we'll go to the next slide. Just remember that, that uh, direct youth involvement offers benefits to the community and to the organization and to the young people. Um, young adults gain experience. They gain experience and confidence working with adults and being around trusting adults, and also about organizations. Organizations get a fresh perspective on youth culture, and I think that's something that's just so valuable um, in terms of hearing it, that different voice in terms of your organization. And also, I think organizations can develop more effective outreach. You heard Michelle talk in, in Riverside County about all the different ways they outreach to try to find youth partners, and they took some non-traditional approaches. So consider that in terms of um, when you're trying to reach out to youth. The next slide. So the next slide, there's two slides that are basically 10 tips for engaging youth in your work. And um, so I'll just go through these quickly, but I think these are really important things to remember. One is that recognizing involving youth is a two-way street. That means that if you're, you need to both outreach and seek input, but they also may have input and want to give input to you in terms of your program and services. Number two is involve a critical mass of youth in your agency's work. One young person cannot represent all youth. I think that's really important. I always think it's always important to invite people in pairs so that people, for one thing, that they're not alone, also if they're coming to a meeting or a gathering with you. Number three, identify a staff person to be a liaison and to coordinate with your youth partner. It's really important. They've got someone to call or text in terms of if they have a question about a meeting or a process or a project and they have, they have direct contact with one of, your, one of the staff. Number four, make certain youth represent the target population the agency is trying to reach. So if you're trying to outreach to a certain ethnic or demographic population or a certain, a certain uh, catchment area in your community, a certain city in your county, make sure the youth come from that area or represent the, the culture or background that you're seeking. Number five, choose youth who have the expertise needed and are well supported by local or state organizations. You've heard about a couple of them here today. Next slide. Number six, provide young people stipends to recognize, professionalize, and incentivize their works. This is really important. Um, it's really important that we honor their participation. That can be done in different ways in stipends. I know that sometimes that's a difficult thing for counties to do. I know in my work, previous county work, that we would sometimes you do that through community-based organizations, and the stipends might come in the, in, in the form of perhaps a direct check to the, to the individual, or also sometimes in gift cards. It depends on what the policy of your organization is. But the point is to, invite, to include some type of stipend to recognize their efforts. Number seven is to provide adult staff with the training that they need to work effectively with youth. Really important. Um, you really want to educate adult staff about the best way to work with youth and how to engage with youth. This will make it more successful for everybody. 
Number eight, be cognizant that timing is an issue. Um, that means in terms of where, how you are engaging youth in terms of when you're going to bring them into your process um, and that type of thing, and that you've had some, you know, you, you're, you're prepared to welcome youth into your process. Number nine is really practical. Hold meetings when young people are available. If you're having meetings between nine and three and, and you want to involve youth that are in high school, you're probably going to have a hard time engaging them, which is sort of practical tips. And then the other, the last tip is to provide youth with feedback um, and clearly demonstrate the impact of their efforts. And I think that's a really important way to, in a very positive way, to be able to give feedback and give information about how, how the work that they're doing is, is helping your organization. So again, these tips and information are in the different handouts that we sent out to you too. And these have been gathered from different sources to, to really help your organization. We know this represents a lot of work. Um, none of these, no one single tip here is something that anybody can really do overnight, but we just want to encourage you to consider this in your work. So um, I want to thank everybody. For, I want to thank you all for your, your questions, um, really good discussion today. And I want to thank our presenters, Eric Wagner, Andres Contreras, Keith Diaz, and Michelle Wool for their really incredible, informative presentation. We're at the end of our time, and I want to thank you for participating today. Um, there's going to be a, 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 a brief survey on the way out when you exit the webinar. We really encourage you to complete it. It really helps us inform our work here at CIBHS. Uh, and the other thing is that you, you'll see a link um, on this last slide with, first of all, my contact information, but also the CIBHS YouTube channel. And you can go there and look for the KDA playlist. And you can listen to this webinar at a future date or share it with a colleague. Once again, uh, that will conclude our broadcast. And thank you so very much for joining us today. Have a good day.